Okay, thank you for the opportunity to present this research. This uh, paper is Risk Perceptions and Protective Behaviors, Evidence from the COVID-19 Pandemic. I'm Kate Bundorf from Duke University. This research is in collaboration with my colleagues from Stanford, Grant Miller, Maria Polyakova, and Jalu Streeter, as well as colleagues from Westat, Jill Dematius, and John Wivig. Uh, we would like to uh, gratefully acknowledge support for this research from Weststat, um, which provided um, in-kind support for designing and fielding the survey. The research questions uh, that we pursued in this project are as follows. First, we were interested in how risky people thought everyday activities were with respect to COVID-19 infection and health outcomes early in the pandemic. In addition, we were interested in whether those risk perceptions varied in ways that were consistent with the objective risk of infection or the objective risk of poor outcomes conditional on infection. Our second question is we were wondering whether people who believe that COVID risks were greater would reduce their activities more. So were subjective risk correlated with, with, with economic activity. And finally, we wanted to know whether people believe their behavior changes in response to these risks would have differed in the absence of government restrictions. We, uh, we have pursued these questions um, but by designing and fielding a survey, and the survey is called the Coronavirus Attitudes and Behaviors Survey. It examined the perceptions of COVID-19 risks and behavioral responses to the pandemic. The survey was administered relatively early in the pandemic um, by Westat between May 7th and May 26th in uh, 2020. What the Westat researchers randomly selected residential addresses to receive an invitation by mail to participate in an online survey. Ultimately, we had 1,222 respondents, that's about a 10% response rate, and the responses were weighted to be nationally rep representative based on demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. Westat has been um, kind enough to make all the data publicly available from this, uh, from this data set, and you can use the link below uh, if you're interested in looking not only at the data we used for this, uh, for this um, study, but also for uh, the other questions that we asked. Okay, one of the first things we asked was about people's perceptions of COVID-19 risks. So we asked um, when people were undergoing particular types of economic activities, what did they think the subject, what was the probability of infection? What the, you know, what were their subjective perceptions of the probability of infection um, when engaging in particular activities? The activities we focused on were going to a movie in a movie theater, um, eating in a restaurant, in a sit-down restaurant, um, using shared transportation services, such as shared rides or riding in a plane, um, using personal services, such as going to the gym or getting your hair cut. We also asked about grocery shopping. We asked people the, in, for each of these types of activities, what was the probability they would be infected with COVID-19 when they engaged in these activities? And the scale was zero, no chance at all, um, to uh, 100, you know, certain to happen. Here we give the results in the blue bars of the probability of infection across all these different services. And as you can see, this is uh, the probabilities were relatively high. Uh, people believe there was a 62% uh, chance that they would um, be infected with COVID under shared transport, when using shared transportation, and a 40% chance um, when they were grocery shopping. At the time of our survey, the prevalence of COVID-19 in the US was approximately 0.5%. So clearly these are much higher uh, than the objective risks, although this is a relatively common finding in the, liter in the literature that on average people evaluate these risks um, uh, uh, higher when asked the question in this way. That green bar at the end is um, a represents a series of questions when we, that we asked um, about the risk of a poor outcome or the risk of severe illness conditional on infection. And people also believe that that was relatively high. Okay, next we took those perceived risks and we correlated them with demographic characteristics to see the extent to which people's risk per perceptions were consistent with epidemiologic evidence at the time. 
So the way to read this graph is we um, estimated a regression where we had the perceived risk on the left-hand side and the demographics on the, on the right-hand side. And each of these lines represents a point estimate and a 95% confidence interval um, from a variable in the regression. So if you look at, um, if you look at the, um, uh, for example, the uh, uh, non-Hispanic uh, black and the Hispanic characteristics, um, the fact that those point estimates and confidence intervals are to the right suggests that uh, people who identified as non-Hispanic Black or Hispanic thought their, um, their subjective perception was that their risk was higher than other folks of infection, as well as um, their risk of or outcome conditional on infection was also higher. Bottom, you know, their risk was higher in engaging in these different activities. Um, the results for age were a little bit different in the sense that um, folks who, uh, uh, folks who um, were older, they didn't necessarily report that they had, had a higher risk of infection, but they did report that they thought their, their likely outcomes would be worse conditional on infection. That's also con uh, consistent with the, um, the evidence at the time. The one place in which the, the, um, this correlation differed from the evidence that was available at the time was for men. Men thought they were less likely to be infected and they were less likely to have a poor outcome conditional on infection. Next, we asked people about their self-reported activity reduction. So this was a question basically saying, um, how have you changed your activities um, since the pandemic began? And uh, one of the categories, the category that I'm reporting here is the proportion of people indicating that they reduce their activity a lot. At the time that we fielded this survey, the um, uh, most people were under some sort of activity restriction. Right, so the blue bars represent people's responses in the, in the actual case of activity restriction. We also asked people a hypothetical. We said, well, if activity restrictions weren't in place in your area, how would you have changed your behavior? And as you can see with the blue bars, people reported changing their behavior a lot, right? So people um, reported for restaurants, for example, that 79% um, of people said that they had reduced this activity a lot. For grocery shopping, 40% of people said that they had reduced this activity a lot. When asking people the hypothetical question, they still said that they would have reduced their behavior in the absence of these activity restrictions, but by less. That's basically saying these red bars are shorter than, than, than the blue bars, right? So still activity reduction um, based on their private choices, um, but not as much as if they, um, as when the activity res uh, restrictions were in place. In this slide, we put together um, our measures of perceived risk and our measures of behavior change. So the idea here is to relate the extent to which people's perceived risks um, is related to their, um, their changes in behavior. What I'm plotting on the slide is what we call the belief elasticity. The belief elasticity is the percent change in the probability of reducing activity a lot associated with a 1% increase in, a, in subjective risk. So what the height of the bar is showing you is how responsive uh, behavior is to people's perceptions um, of risk and a higher bar means it's more responsive. In the blue bars, uh, we're plotting the belief elasticity under the situation, uh, the, kind of the actual situation where people were um, exposed to activity restrictions. And you can see that um, the uh, that people were responsive to their um, uh, re uh, that people's behavior was responsive to their perceived uh, their perceived risks of infection um, for these uh, for these activities. The red bars, however, are higher. That's basically saying when we ask people how much they would have changed their activity in the absence of uh, these types of restrictions, um, their their responses, their activity changes were more responsive to their risk. So to summarize our main findings, we find that people substantially overestimated the risk of contracting COVID-19 early in the pandemic.
although they overestimated the absolute risk, we think that people had more accurate perceptions of their relative risks. How was their risk com compared to other people or how high was their risk compared to other people? We also find that people um, who believed that they faced a higher level of risk were more likely to report avoiding economic activities. And then the government mandates that restrict economic behavior attenuated that relationship between subjective risk beliefs and protective behaviors. The implications of our findings, um, uh, we believe that um, our, our results show that you know, people believe that a substantial proportion of their behavior change um, associated with these, that is often associated with these government uh, regulations regarding economic activity probably would have taken place in the absence of these regulations. So people's private decisions um, uh, guided their uh, reduction in activity. This is important in thinking about uh, the development of models um, that evaluate the effects of policies um, designed to um, uh, restrict behaviors. In addition, we think that our evidence is consistent with government mandates reducing an externality that lower risk people who in the absence of, of, of policy might uh, privately choose to invest in fewer protective behaviors. It will reduce the externality that these low risk folks are exerting on high risk individuals. And finally, we think this idea of um, uh, the relationship between subjective risk perceptions um, and behavior is important to consider in policy. So both policymakers and researchers should think about subjective risks, how they're formed and how they influence behavior um, as a policy mechanism. Thank you.